So the next session is Trade, Immigration, and Inequality. Um, you know, many in academia, including myself, have advanced arguments, theoretical arguments, and evidence about the benefits of migration. Of course, political sentiments these days are, are different. So the organizers, in a not so subtle scheme to show you what the benefits of immigration are, organize a session full of Latin American immigrants <laughs> and one Russian. <laughs> so, so hopefully we'll all benefit from it. So the first uh, presenter is Ariel Burstein from UCLA. The bottom line is to read that there could be huge wealth for gays from having Latin American economies in the United States. <laughs> so th th this is... Thank you. So uh, thanks so much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to present here. So this is joint work with Gordon Hanson, Lin Tian, who's sitting there, and John Vogel. So as Esteban say, said, so this is part of the very active, contested, and very policy-relevant literature uh, discussion on what's the labor market impact of, of, of immigration. A lot of this literature has looked at comparisons across uh, regions, like there's an inflow of Cubans in Miami, what happens in Cuba, on native workers versus other cities like Cincinnati, or looking at broad education groups like high school dropouts versus college. These are important uh, dimensions of exposure, but we're going to start a bit more disaggregated. We're going to think about variation within regions. So say, take Los Angeles. We're going to think about variation in, in, in outcomes across jobs that are differentially exposed to immigration. And specifically, we're going to think about two dimensions of, of exposure to Im immigration, or two, two dimensions of their uh, within regions. One is um, occupations or industries differ in terms of their, how important immigrants are in that uh, occupation or industry. We're going to think of that as, we're going to define it as immigration intensity. And the other, and, and think about this as housekeeping, which is, which is very immigrant intensive versus uh, fire, fire, firefighting. And the other, uh, the other dimension that we're going we're to think about is tradability. That how tradable is, is, is the output produced by these industries or occupation. And here, think about, say, textile machine operation, where the output can be sold to other regions in the United States. And we're going to think that we're going to look at the adjustment being very different to immigration when you compare this type of uh, industries or occupations. So the paper, in the paper, we're going to do three things. Uh, not in this order, but let me descri describe it here in this order. So first, we're going to document empirically that when, when uh, immigrants come to town, say Los Angeles, within, within a region of the United States, um, we're going to look at what happens to native workers if they're displaced away from immigrant intensive occupations towards non-immigrant intensive occupations. We're going to find that that's the case within the set of non-traded occupations. So we're going to call that crowding out. So immigrant uh, native workers move away from occupations where, which employ a lot of immigrants. In contrast, within the set of tradable occupations or industries, we're not going to find that. We're going to find tightly estimated neither crowding out or crowding in. So very different margin of adjustment. There's big displacement within non-tradable occupations and, and industries, not within tradable industries or occupations. The second thing, we're going to think theoretically, using a simple model, why the, the, the adjustment could be so different within the set of trade and trade occupations. And we're going to argue that one big characteristic that differs between these two sets is how sensitive is demand to, to price changes. So um, prices are going to be, the quantities are going to be much more sensitive to prices within the set of uh, trade occupations, very elastic demands in contrast to non trade occupations. So the idea is going to be that when immigrants come into a city, the price of immigrant intensive occupations is going to fall, okay, because the supply of those, those, those industries or occupations are going to go up. If the price falls a lot, that's going to hurt workers that, that start in those occupations. Whereas for tradable occupations or industries, the prices, is, is local shocks have a much smaller impact on, on, on prices, so that negative effect is going to be much weaker. So that's why we're going to see this differential adjustment. So we're going to illustrate that in a very simple model, <coughs> and then we're going to construct a more qualitative model with, with, uh, with, with, uh, which feature other margins to see what, that, what this uh, mechanism implies for variation in outcomes 
and wage outcomes across workers that start in different occupations within a region. And we're going to argue that <coughs> workers in immigrant intensive occupations, like uh, housekeeping, they're going to gain less or they're going to lose when immigrants come to town compared to other occupations in non-tradable industries that are less uh, immigrant intensive. And that's going to be, whereas within the set of tradable occupations, uh, the, the, heterogeneity, the heterogeneity in wage out outcomes is going to be much, much, much smaller. Okay? And that within heterogeneity in outcomes is going to be very large compared to the standard across cities or across education groups way changes. So let me, let me kind of tell you very, very briefly what are the main, how we, how we uh, illustrate this, this, this mechanism using a model. Then I'm going to show you kind of the, 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 the main uh, empirical findings, and then I'm going to tell you what it means in terms of counterfactuals using a quantitative model. So the, the theory has three ingredients. So I just show, I'm going to just illustrate what these ingredients are. So regions are, so we're going to have 722 commuting zones in the United States, they're going, to, they're going to produce a bunch of occupations, O's. We're going to do everything at the industry level as well, but I'm going to focus here on, on occupations. And they're going to be using as inputs to produce in each region uh, labor. There could be other factors that aren't the productivity terms A's, but I'm not going to talk about that here. So, uh, so, so these occupations are going to employ labor. And I'm going to use uh, LRI, so be efficiency units of immigrant workers born in foreign countries, and LRD is going to denote efficiency units of native-born uh, workers. Two things to notice here. First, I'm going to allow for uh, these two factors to be imperfect substitutes. So rho is going to index how substitutable they are. If rho is equal to infinity, they're perfect substitutes. We're going to allow for rho to be less than infinity. You can think of an alternative micro foundation for this production function, where it, native and immigrants are perfect substitutes within tasks. So a, a, an occupation is produced combining many tasks. Within each task, there are perfect substitutes, but there's differential, the difference comp compared advantage. So immigrants specialize in certain uh, tasks because of language or education, et cetera, versus in native workers. That gives exactly the same ri rise to the same production function. And the second thing is that they could be uh, immigrants can be more or less productive within an occupation uh, as given by the A's. And that, that the A's, the productivity, the average productivity of immigrant versus native workers is going to determine uh, whether an immigration is, uh, whether an occupation is immigrant intensive or not. So that, that S is going to denote the share of immigrants in occupation O in region R. A, a, an occupation with a high S, we're going to call it an immigrant intensive occupation. And we're going to observe S in the data, so we're going to basically back out the A's to explain that in the data, to explain, to explain that the shares in the data. The second ingredient is going to be that within each, each occupation, it's going to have an, a, an upward sloping supply of workers in an occupation. Okay, so and the way we're going to model that is basically that workers choose across different occupations. So there's an occupation choice because they have some idiosyncratic skill between working as a professor or working in finance. Depending on the skill, they're going to choose one occupation or the other and given the wages. So the W's are efficiency unit wages. We're going to call that occupation wages, and the epsilon is the idiosyncratic scale. Okay, so the reason that the fact that there's dispersion is epsilon, so some some agents are better as professors compared to finance, and, and vice versa. It's going to be that it, it's going to imply that there's going to be an upward sloping supply of workers into that occupation, and hence we're going to have different occupation wages across occupations. Okay, okay. If, if the epsilons were the same across occupations, then the wage has to be the same across occupations. And the, the dispersion is going to determine how, how the elasticity of the labor supply um, of the occupation. And the, 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 the other thing that I didn't say is that there's a, there's a supply of workers, of native workers, domestic, and immigrant workers, NIRs. We're going to take that as given here. In the, in the full model, we're going to endogenize the mobility of workers as well. So that's the second ingredient. Again, the reason is so we have an upward sloping supply of workers into an occupation. And the third uh, ingredient of the model is that we want to have what's the difference in, in tradability here? What is it going to do? It's going to affect the, the price sensitivity of demand. Okay, so we, basically, in the end, what we're going to have is that uh, occupations are the demand faced by an occupation is more elastic within the set of tradable occupations than within the set of non tradable occupations. The, the way we model that is very simple. So 
there's a final good that combines different occupations. Say uh, that that's that's could be a lot with, with a parameter elasticity eta, which is a low number, okay, compared to another elasticity alpha, which is so say take furniture, so absorption of furniture in a city uses furniture from different other regions. So that's just that's like the, the, the type of elasticity that they was talking about theta, we're gonna go that alpha. And alpha is gonna be a high number compared to eta. In the end, the, 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 the elasticity faced by an occupation, the demand elasticity, is gonna be a weighted average of these two parameters. Okay? And the, where the share on the Armington elasticity alpha is increasing in the trade share. In the extreme, when alpha is equal to infinity, when the goods are very uh, uh, very substitutable across 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 uh, different source locations, then epsilon is going to be very high. In the end, when alpha is equal to infinity, it's like a price taker. So for, and we're going to think that so we're going to group occupations in two, tradable and non-tradable. And because tradable occupations are going to have a higher trade share, they're going to put a higher weight on alpha, and that's going to give rise to a to a, a bigger sensitivity of, of demand to prices. Okay, epsilon t big on epsilon n. That's going to be the key dimension that is going to matter in terms of tradability, the price sensitivity. What, is, what are these three models, these three ingredients going to imply? So this is kind of the main slide in terms of this mechanism that I referred to in the intro. So suppose there's an inflow of immigrants into a region. And what I want to study is what happens to the allocation of workers across occupations within that region and what happens to wages across occupations. And why is that adjustment different within tradables and within non-tradables? So here it goes. So suppose there's, a, there's an increase of immigrants in a region. There's two ways to accommodate this higher number of workers, immigrant workers, across occupations. There's no unemployment here. Okay. So one is you can just so you need you need to uh, um, allocate this this higher number of immigrants across occupations. One margin is just move workers towards the occupations that use a lot of immigrants. Okay. So that's the expansion of immigrant disoccupations. And that's going to give rise, rise to crowding in, right? Because you have to move workers towards the occupations that use a lot of immigrants, including native workers. You're going to move them there. That's crowding in. And this force is stronger the more sensitive is occupation demand to price, the higher is epsilon t. So this, if, this force is going to be stronger for trade occupations. The second way of, of, of accommodating this higher number of immigrants is to make every occupation more uh, immigrant intensive. That's why the wage of immigrant workers is going to fall relative to the wage of, of native workers. Okay? And that's going to give rise to crowding out. You want to move workers away from immigrant intensive occupations, so that you, including native workers. Okay? And this, this force is stronger the more substitutable are native and immigrant workers, as given by Rho. Now, occupation wage are going to exactly follow the patterns of, of relocation. So if native workers need to move into immigrant intensive occupations, then the wage has to go up in those occupations compared to the other occupations. So if you need to move native workers from firefighters to, to, to housekeepers, then the wage of housekeepers has to go up relative to the wage of, 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 um, of firefighters. That's the case of crowding in. Crowding out is exactly, exactly the opposite. Okay? So we can express this compactly, because in the end we're going to estimate this parameter's beta. So if you take two occupations within either within the set of tradable or within the set of non-tradable occupations, that's, that's G, and you take the difference, all the lowercase characters are log changes between two time periods, so the, the change in occupation O minus O prime is going to be proportional to the inflow of immigrants into region R, that's NRI, the little n, that's how many immigrants come in, times the, ch the difference in the immigrant intensity between the two occupations, Let's say that that's a positive number, so occupation O is more immigrant intensive. And beta, if it's negative, it means that the number of workers is increasing by less in the immigrant intensive occupation compared to the less immigrant intensive occupation, so that's crowding out. So beta is negative when there's crowding out, and beta is positive if there's crowding in. And in this simple model, that really depends on the comparison between these two parameters, rho and epsilon. If, 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 workers, if these two workers are very substitutable, compared to the price sensitivity of demand, epsilon, then there's crowding out. If, epsilon, if rho is less than epsilon, there's, there's crowding in, or if they're the same, you just allocate workers proportionally across occupations. Now, what's the, what's the difference in between adjustment in tradable versus non-tradable occupations? The main difference here is in terms of this parameter epsilon. Okay, so you can see that the force, num 
the second force is going to be, sorry, the first force is going to be stronger for traded occupations. So there's going to be relatively more crowding in or less crowding out within the set of traded occupations compared to the set of non-traded occupations. That's the key comparative study that we have. In terms of wages, remember wages move kind of proportionally with, with allocations. What that means is that wages are going to fall by more in immigrant occupations in the set of non-traded occupations than in the set of traded occupations. That is, workers that start in an immigrant occupation are hurt by more, or they, they lose more, or they gain less within the set of non-tradable than within the set of tradable occupations. Okay? So that's kind of the main, the main implication beta we're going to look at, we're going to, we're going to use uh, in terms of looking at the, the, these adjustments in this, within occupations. Okay, so we're going to estimate these betas, and then we're going to use these estimates to guide a, the parametrization of a more, a more beefed up version of the model. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is what happens, do we see crowding in or crowding out? So let me, let me, let me tell you very quickly, not a, in, in, as, in, as much, in as much detail as, as, as Dave, so I'm going to just summarize what we did, uh, how we take the model to the data, first in a more reduced form way, and then, and then um, in, 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 in using the full structured model. So we're going to first incorporate national occupation fixed effect because the number of occupation, the number of workers by occupations could change for other reasons that, that, that are not due to immigration. Second, we're going to obviously allow for native and immigrant workers to be differential, to be to have different e education. So we're going to run this regression by education, by, by by education of the native workers, and we're going to allow we're going to take into account the education of the immigrants. We run this regression. Third, we're going to restrict the, this beta to be, we're going to estimate the average beta across regions, so it's like an average treatment. So we're going to impose the same beta across Rs. And four, because of possible correlation between immigration inflows into a region and other occupation region productivity shocks, deviations from, from region, group, and occupation means, those, those could be correlated. So we're going to instrument using a, a variant of the card instrument, which allocates immigrants according to the share of where they were located in some initial year. Okay? The, 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 I mean, the card instrument has faced a lot of, a lot of um, criticism in the literature, but given that we have a region group occupation fixed effect, some of these concerns are less pressing. Okay, so, so we're going to use data from the census, 1998 to 2012. The key is how we measure tradability. We're not going to innovate much here. We're going to use an, an off-the-shelf measure from the literature from Blinder and Kruger which measured, the, the, uh, measured occupations in terms of their offshore ability, even though our, our data is within the United States. So that this, is, this is one of the best measures we, we had, and, and, and basic, uh, other researchers have checked that this is a good measure in terms of what, what firms actually do, what jobs they offshore. We all, we, our results are very robust if we use industries instead of occupations where we use tr uh, tradeability in terms of agriculture, manufacturing, and mining. Just to give you kind of what, what, are, what are the examples of the most traded occupations, we have 50 occupations. So the, the least traded occupations are things like firefighting, therapies, construction trade, etc. Traded occupations are things like textile machine operators, records processing, etc. So, so now we're going to run a version of that, of that regression that was motivated from the model, but we have a, it's a bit of extended, as, as I mentioned before. before. And we're, going to, we're going to run it for low education native workers and for high education and native workers, and we're going to do it always OLS and IV and reduced form. Two things that come out, the, the beta for tradable occupations is tightly estimated at zero, so there's neither crowding in or crowding out within tradables. Okay? The second implication is that within the set of non tradable occupations, you can see all these negative numbers, there's crowding, there's more, there, these are negative numbers, which means this, this is, this is interacted with a dummy here, which means there's more crowding out within tra non trade occupations than within traders. And if you add up these two, you can see there's also crowding out within the set of non trade That's exactly, that, that's the robust implication from the model. Into how to interpret these magnitudes before going to the full model, if you take Los Angeles between 80 and 2012, and you, take, you compare two occupations that have a big difference in terms of exposure to immigration, in terms of their immigrant density, so if you take private household services versus firefighters that are non trade occupations, so the difference in exposure is 0.65. If you multiply by these betas, you get a number like 0.22, which means that labor uh, uh, falls by 22% in the immigrant occupations 
compared like, like private households compared to firefighters. What does that imply for wages? Using the simple model, you need a labor supply elasticity for that to translate this number. So if you use a labor supply elasticity of two, that implies that the wage falls by 11% for private household services compared to firefighters in this period. So it's 11% difference. Okay? So um, we do a lot of robustness. Um, the model has also has implications for how, how revenues respond in one set of uh, occupations versus the other set of occupations. And in particular, the model says that revenues should increase in immigrant intensive occupations, and they should increase by more within the set of tradable than within the set of non-tradable occupations, because the price falls by less within the set of tradable occupations. We don't observe revenues, but we observe labor payments. Okay? So that's how we're going to measure the revenues. And we find exactly that, that within the set of non-tradable occupations, uh, um, re revenues for labor payments increase by less in immigrant intensive occupations compared to the set of trade occupations. And that's kind of consistent with the, with the main implication of the, of the theory. So, so finally, we, we put all this, all this insight and the estimates together. We, we build a, a, more, a more kind of richer model where you have workers differentiated by education. We, ha we allow for agglomeration and congestions at the aggregate level by region. We allow for workers to move around regions. And we, we, we saw the full general equilibrium, the analytics were under assumption of small urban economy. We're going to target those estimates, and that's how we're going to choose the main parameters of the model. Um, so let me kind of, and, uh, so then let, me, let me explain how the model works, and this is, this is, I'm going to show these counterfactuals, and then I'm going to finish by just, so, the, so, I get, so these are feeding a counterfactual. We're going to engineer some change in the immigrants, in the number of immigrants in the model, and we're going to see what happens. So this is, hopefully a counterfactual, which is a reduction by half in the, in the number of Latin American immigrants. Okay? And so this is, let's focus, let's zo zoom in in one region, let's say Los Angeles. Okay? So this is, every dot here is, the w is, is an occupation. The blue dots are tradable occupations, and the red dots are non-tradable occupations. And the y-axis is the change in the wage of a worker that starts in, the, in that occupation. The first thing that you can see is that within the set of tradable occupations, so this is a reduction in the number of immigrants, no, not an increase as in the theory. So, so sorry for the confusion. For, that, that could be a bit complicated. To, to, you have to switch to the signs. So if you look at the wage across a set of trade occupations, they don't vary much across occupations. Bec and this is consistent that with the fact that we didn't find crowning in or crowning out for trade occupations. On average, you can see that workers lose. This is a reduction in the number of immigrants, so workers are worse. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're in a very exposed occupation or in a not very exposed occupation. This is very different within the set of non trade occupations. So the, the, these are um, um, firefighters that do not use a lot of immigrants in Los Angeles. The wage falls, okay, because you're reducing the number of immigrants. There's, it's a complementary factor. However, um, um, gardeners or, or, or uh, the very exposed immigration uh, uh, occupations, they go to actually uh, uh, gain by, by 5% or 8% compared to the less exposed occupation. So there's huge variation across uh, occupations in terms of the wage uh, output, in, in terms of the wage change. Okay? So very different adjustment um, compared to the two set of occupations. Now, you can look at, this is Los Angeles, so this is, each dot now is a different city. We have 732 commuting zones. And you can see that the max minus the mean, the more versus less exposed occupation within the Non set of non-tradable jobs, the, chain, the variation in wages is very large. So we're talking about 10% difference in, if you're in the more or less exposed non-tradable occupation, whereas if you, if you look at tradable occupations, the difference is very small. Now, you can aggregate up. This is more like similar to what people have looked at. You can com compute the average change in real wages in Los Angeles or Miami is a more exposed commuting zone here. You can see that on average, wages fall, the real wage falls, when immigrants leave, again, the, uh, this, uh, this is a complementary factor, and we have agglomeration forces, and the skilled premium falls when you reduce uh, the number of, of, of uh, unskilled immigrants. Okay? So, uh, but, 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 the, the, but this average is hide a lot of heterogeneity across occupations that I showed you before. The final thing, suppose you do another kind of factor, which is, suppose you double the number of high-skilled immigrants. Okay? So now we are increasing the number of immigrants, Again, on average, wages go up, in, especially in, in, in locations like San Jose that uh, uh, have a lot of high-skilled immigrants. Okay? 
but the, within a region, say within Los Angeles, there's a large variation in wage changes across occupations. So you can see, still see that non-trade occupations, this line is steeper than within the set of trade occupations. However, the slopes are much similar now, and that's because the source of the shock matters. High-skilled immigrants, they're much more evenly al allocated across regions in the United States. So this distinction between tradable and non-tradable matters much less if it's the same shock that affects all regions. So let me finish here. Uh, so we study the impact of immigration across workers who are differentially exposed, either because for standard, I mean, as, as was studied before, different regions receive different number of immigrants, and immigrants are differentially important across occupations, and uh, because of tradability. So the different, diff different occupations have a different uh, price sensitivity of, of demand. We show theoretically and empirically that there's relatively more crowding out across a set of non-trade occupations than across a set of trade occupations. And in particular, natives, are ex natives that are more exposed to immigration within the set of non-trade jobs lose my more from immigration compared to, to those that are exposed uh, to immigrants within the set of trade occupations. Quantitatively, we show that on average, immigration raises the real wage of native workers. That depends on a lot of many other details of the model, but, but that's what we get in our, in our framework. But this average variation in wages across locations is small compared to the large uh, cross-section, uh, across-occupation uh, heterogeneity in wage changes, especially in the set of non-trade occupations. And finally, the nature of the shock matters for the differ this differential adjustment in trade and non-trade. Thanks. OK, thanks, Ariel. Uh, that is Lorenzo Caliendo from Yale School of Management. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for the invitation and uh, to allow me to discuss this paper. I have to make a comment about Costa Rica and Uruguay. Uh, the fact that next year a Uruguay is going to be a visiting assistant professor that puts Uruguay on top of Costa Rica. Uh, beyond, beyond football, etc. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so let me see. So I want to try to put this paper in context. Uh, so let me start basically saying that there seems to be a widespread consensus among academics that uh, freer trade is beneficial to all. In fact, uh, there's a poll conducted by University of Chicago, the IGM expert panel. They ask expert economists, uh, academics, uh, what do they think about free trade? There's a question that they ask, which is, uh, do you agree to the idea that freer trade improves production efficiency and offers consumer better choices? 96% of academic economists actually agree on that. Uh, they ask another question, which is, for example, on average, do citizens of the US are going to be are better off because of NAFTA? It turns out to be that 98% of uh, academics actually believe that yes. So if you look at academics in general, they do believe that there's a consensus that free trade is uh, beneficial. Uh, but policymakers seem not to agree as much. In fact, you can ask her why uh, is the US actually doing on hitting NAFTA? And if you look at academics now, there's going to be some pushback on free trade. And it turns out to be that recent academic papers, uh, studies have actually, actually are, are against free trade. And in fact, they have been focusing on things like uh, distribution and effects of trade, uh, the fact that some workers are worse off, better than others, adjustment costs, and more. Now, but if you look at the migration literature, there's clearly no consensus among academics in terms of uh, is free or migration beneficial to all, yes or no. Uh, they ask the same questions, but focusing on migration to the same poll of experts. Uh, this is the question they ask, for example, which is, uh, would the average US citizen would be better off if a larger number of highly educated foreign workers were legally allowed to enter into the US each year? So academics, 94% of academics actually tend to agree that yes. But if you ask the same question focusing on low skill workers, the answer is 63%, okay? So, and if you look at, uh, in general, uh, of course, policymakers also disagree. Uh, academics here do disagree substantially uh, uh, in terms of the, the effects of uh, migration, uh, in terms of welfare, and there's many mechanisms. What this paper basically is doing is basically bringing tools from an area that there's a lot of consensus in terms of the, the effects of trade, trying to make progress on the area of migration where there's less consensus. I think bottom line, I think this is a very nice and elegant paper. 
uh, the paper basically is providing one new mechanism in terms of the adjustment uh, uh, cost, if you want, of migration. Uh, the idea is that the adjustment to immigration varies within the sets of tradable and untradable jobs. The paper basically provides new theoretical results. Uh, it shows how these tradable and untradable distinctions basically arise in a general equilibrium model. Uh, it provides new empirical results. It presents uh, what I'm going to call robust, robust uh, reduced form evidence of these particular mechanisms that they're actually focusing on. And then it provides a quantitative results in a fully general equilibrium model that quantifies the implications of labor market outcomes in general equilibrium and the implications of their channel. So given all this, I only have a few set of comments. Uh, so my first comment is going to be, yeah, so a few set of comments. Uh, so my first comment is going to be about the empirical analysis, OK? So suppose you want to study the economic effects of this, uh, this new mechanism that they're actually focusing on. So the literature basically has taken uh, two approaches to answer this question. One, it's purely reduced form, OK? When people actually argue this idea of like let the data speak, OK? But that reduced form also comes with challenges, which is one challenge is kind of, challenge is kind of what is the shock? Okay, so basically, are we truly identifying the channel that you actually want to, want to study? So it's difficult to separate the role of, in this case, of migration, driving that force compared to other, other things happening at the same time, like trade, technology. Another channel is that you cannot talk about aggregate effects, you cannot talk about level effects, and it's clearly not suitable to think about the general aggregate effects. Yeah. Now, another way, another approach is like go purely structural, okay? Now, if you go purely structural, it also comes with challenges, I mean, you might be able to say something, you're gonna say clearly things about the aggregate, you're gonna think about, say things about the level effects. You can nail down the, the identify the channel, the, your mechanism, how important it is for the aggregate. However, it's hard to discipline the shocks, and it's very hard to discipline the elasticities, okay? So what this paper is truly doing, I think it's a great example of combining both things in a very good way. So I think they're very good in terms of the reduced form, and they're guiding their structural model using those, those reduced form very seriously. However, uh, I think that the paper, uh, given all their apparatus, the paper could present much more results, okay? In particular, I think uh, uh, if you look at the contrafactuals that actually uh, Ariel was pointing out, like half in the, the number of migrants, of uh, Latin American migrants in half, uh, you mostly focus on Los Angeles, but you're not focused on how important is, how important is your channel for the aggregate economy. I would like to study, I would, I would like to know, for example, what are distributional consequences in the US from your particular, with your model, you can do it. What are the aggregate implications of your channel vis-a-vis -vis potentially other channels? Uh, which are the occupations that win, win and lose more? Uh, what are the implications for the distribution of income across phase? All of that you can actually deliver. Uh, it should be easy to deliver with your model. Once you have it, uh, I, I will use it. And also, pushing back for a second, uh, what are the short run and long run effects of this? What do I mean by this? So in the model, I guess one way to think about this model is basically after all the adjustment, what will be the implications from this particular shock? But uh, in addition, you can use a model to think about what will be the, like the short run effects without allowing some adjustment compared to the long run effects. Policymakers in particular might focus more on the short run effects we care more about the long run effect. So let me give you an example how these uh, things actually can vary, and that can help. That can help policymakers to think about not focusing so much on the short run effects. Uh, I'm not saying that we should ignore it, but uh, thinking that there's a process for readjustment for all the economy for a particular shock. So look, for example, of the China shock. So imports from China uh, and the US almost doubled from 2000 to 2007. And, and what this paper does is tries to, another paper which I'm gonna, I'm gonna be citing now, tries to understand the effects that that had over different labor markets in the US. And if you look at the short run effect, which is truly exactly after the year 2007, what you find is that manufacturing real wages job at the impact across states in the US actually went down. But that's only the manufacturing sector across states in the US. But if you let the process of readjustment allow people to move across sectors, potentially move across space, uh, and then what you will get in the long run is that eventually we all win, okay? So things like this I think will be interesting to actually uh, uh, show uh, in your, in, with your results, okay? So second point I wanna make is the economic effects of migration crucially depend on the extent to which countries are open to trade. Uh, so there's a lot of studies on this, theoretical studies, uh, some new quantitative studies. If you look at theory, so 
I was hoping to see Jean around, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, there you are. So I had to cite Jean, given that Jean was it. So Jean 1984 was one of the earlier studies actually to show this in a theory a piece. Uh, and given that David is here, so I had to cite David. So Davis and Weinstein basically show this in a context of a two country, Ricardian model, and trade. And, uh, and they really show that it really matters. If you're thinking about the effects of migration in an open economy vis-a-vis -vis a closed economy. So to the extent the country, how, how open is the country, uh, that would actually affect uh, the results. Uh, so quantitatively, we know less. However, given that I was here, I have to cite myself. So in Caliendo 2018, we quantified the economic effects of the 2004 EU enlargement, uh, which was free trading goods and free, uh, gold, free labor mobility because there was a sequential process in which countries open to migration across other countries. And that variation allows us to study the effects of migration and, and trade. And what we find is that quanti quantitative results do vary if you think about a, a incorporating trade or not, or taking into account the process of uh, uh, opening to trade at the same time that you're opening for migration. Bottom line, we find that the absence of changes to trade policy, the U15 would actually be worse off after the enlargement. So last, last uh, comment has to do with a, does only tradability matter? So I think it's an important channel, but there could be other channels. So I tried to find in the literature if we actually have another paper that actually focuses on something related. Uh, and I think the logic of the theory is very clear, as I said before. Uh, there's no adjustment in prices in trade while occupation. That's a key implication of your, of your theory. However, there's other mechanisms that could also deliver similar results in terms of prices but not necessarily on quantities, okay? What are the mechanisms? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna focus now in a second. So Clemens, uh, this is a forthcoming paper in 2017 in the AER. They studied the Mexican Brasero exclusion of 1965. What is this? This was a policy goal to exclude Braceros. Bracero basically comes from brazos, arms, which basically means manual. So I can say Braceros, I cannot say laborer, labor, okay? <laughs> to improve labor market conditions uh, in the U.S. farmers. That was the, the, the goal of this policy. So uh, Doug, so Doug might know, I mean, the history of, of the U.S. He was talking about yesterday about trade policy. He might want to write a, a book about migration policy in, in the future, okay? So that's an interesting policy. And the point of this study, they want to understand what happened to natives after they had this shock. This is roughly 500,000 half a million Mexicans that were coming to particular sectors in the U.S. to work with particular skills, and they want to study the effect that that had over those farmers in the U.S. across different, uh, uh, according to how exposed it is that particular farmer. So what they find is no effects on wages of natives after this. They find no effects on employment on natives, and they find that there was a reduction in the quantity producer of, uh, of producers of the most exposed area, okay? Uh, interesting, what they find is for some sectors, all of them tradables, they even find no effect on quantity. And the argument is that there was a substitution. Instead of using braceros, they started using machines. So they were able to produce exactly the same quantity as before, not hire more natives and use machines. But in other sectors, which actually look much more similar to the story that I was putting in up front, which is you substitute, what you do is you reduce the quantity produced, you don't affect prices of, of natives. So let me show you three slides. So the first picture here, what it shows is the most exposed area, which is the darker one related to the others. That's the shock, the reduction in the employment, the average employment in Braceros across, ex across exposed areas. That's the trend on wages on the exposed area compared to the other areas. And what you see, there was no change in trend in wages. So wages seem to be not affected by this shock. And when you look at here, which is the Mexican worker, that's the average reduction in the Mexican workers on the most exposed area, what happened to the domestic workers? Well, there seems to be no change in domestic workers after the shock, okay? And then when you look at what I was saying before, in terms of quantity produced, both of them seem to be tradable sectors, tradable goods that are produced. And tomatoes, and the story that they showed is tomatoes, they substituted workers, braceros, for machines. And they were actually prepared for that, eh, which argues against basically how exogenous was the shock. But if you look at sugar beets, what they did is they reduced completely okay, uh, the quantity produced. So bottom line, which I'm out of time, I think it's a great paper. I think it provides a very key, simple insight, which is one cannot look at a migration shock as an aggregate labor supply shock. Uh, you should look at the occupation exposed to the shock and then how tradable is that particular occupation. I think, uh, I think it makes this point very clear and I think it's a must read article uh, for policymakers and academic. Uh, so thank you very much.